Thank you, Lord. Lord, you have it all together, Lord. God, you are the way maker. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord spoke to me these words before, uh, right before I came up. He said, you don't have to have it all together. You just have to know who has it all together. Doesn't that feel good? Sometimes in my life I feel unprepared or unqualified. But then the glory of the Lord steps into my situation. Today we were at church. I pastor in Marysville. And there was two individuals that got baptized in Jesus' name. So I got up at the very end of the service and I just felt like there was another person. And so I got done and I'm like, Lord, maybe I missed you. And then Jeff comes around the corner. He's like, Pastor, I'm ready to get baptized in Jesus' name. God, we baptized three people today in Jesus name and on Friday we baptized another that's four people that God filled with the Holy Ghost and was baptized in Jesus name I want to give the glory to the Lord because it's getting ready to happen in this church if you'll start to believe not just sing it but just start to believe it inside of you that something's coming over me there's a fire getting ready to consume my spirit and I believe it preacher I don't just believe it but I know that God has my back hallelujah God for an apostolic church in Kashaka. Thank you, Lord. I give honor. My brother and sister Nutter. Sister Nutter knew I was coming, so she didn't show up. Just kidding. And uh, the good looking Nutter boy, uh, I think he's funnier than Anthony, so I'm just saying that out today. <laughs> just read time I said that. And, uh, but I love your pastor. And, uh, he's a good man. And uh, he came this path the right way. Sometimes the path takes a little bit longer and sometimes it can get a little bumpy. But when God puts you there, it's going to be right. I know when God put me in Marysville, it was a little bumpy. Got a little rough. But I know what revival smells like because I'm living right in the middle of it. And this is a church, I'm telling you right now. If you'll believe what I'm getting ready to preach today, God don't want to just restore people in this church and in this community. God wants to reinstate them. When something becomes reinstated, that means you get paperwork. You don't just restore the, the car, but you get the paperwork, the title to it. God's going to put some families in this church. I feel this in the Holy Ghost. If you will reach out to this community like God's calling you to reach out to this community, there there will not just be restoration in this church, but there'll be a reinstatement of seeds that have been sown in this area for the past decades, and God's going to bring them back. You keep your ears open, and you keep your mouth flowing, and God's going to step into that situation. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel 1, 9 and 11. 1 Samuel 1. I don't think she aged. I looked up there, and I know this sounds, but I'm telling you, you look exactly like you did back then. There's some people you cannot say that to, like me, but to her I can say that. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And Hannah vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will thou unto thine handmaid a man child, then will I give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall be no razor come upon his head. Before you're seated this afternoon, turn to your neighbor, tell them they look better than you, and then you can be seated. I want to preach for the next few moments. How far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to go? You ever face a time in your life when you've had enough? We all face seasons in our life where it seems that our life is on a treadmill and we seem to be moving our feet but gaining no ground. I remember there was a time in my life where I was talking to the Lord. You know the times. It's less like talking to God, and it's more like complaining to Him. I told the Lord, He said, I said, I'm going to give you so much, and I have been giving you so much of my time, my energy, and my family. I was complaining so well that day that I almost believed myself by the end of the rant. Everybody ever been there before. You wanted to be further ahead than where you were. After I was done educating God on how valuable I was, 
He said nothing. I mean, I thought God was supposed to comfort my pain, help me when I was overwhelmed, justify my frustration. All that day I got was complete and utter silence. Until one day I was at a conference and somebody came up to me and spoke some of the wisest words I've ever heard, even of this day. These words that I was about to hear was the answer to my complaining that particular day. I was not expecting for God to send a messenger that day, but that day God decided it was time that I understand why I was so frustrated with that time in my life and in my ministry. The words spoken to me that day were, whatever you give up to God, God will always bless you with more than you have given. A lot of times in our walk with God, we give and we give. We give money. We give time. We've got uh, this giving. And can I have one of those papers? I'm going to grab one of those. And we have, we have this form here. It's God's house. And I think you do this annually. Is that correct? And I believe the whole anchor network does it, which I believe it's a big thing. Because when you give to God, you expect to get in return. When you give time, you expect God to give you in return. And sometimes you give money and you don't see it come back. And the money, as David Smith said, the money gets a little funny, don't it? And the bills get a little bit darker than you want to go. And the singing that you've been doing, the preaching, the praying, the consecrating, the consuming in your life, all it does is go reverse when it should go forward. But I got a word for this church today. If you'll believe what I'm getting ready to preach to you, whatever you're going to give up, as God sends revival like he's never given to this city and to this church before, whatever you're willing to give up, God will give you more in return if you believe that why don't you stand to your feet and why don't you rejoice not where you are but where God is getting ready to take you Hallelujah. you can be seated you mean I cannot outgive God everyone say no I remember when we started our church five years ago it was just me my lovely wife and my three children I didn't proselyte, I didn't call local pastor, I didn't go looking for other people. I just started going for the lost people of the world. And I remember the scripture came to mind, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man according as his purpose in his heart. Notice it's a heart condition that changes who we are. A lot of times hell will tell you that you're not worthy and you're not good enough and you don't have the pedigree and, and, and hell will give you a list of reasons why you can't succeed and why you can't be productive for the kingdom. Hell will tell you you've messed up too long. You can't be reinstated. You can't be restored. You can't be changed. But I'm here telling you as a preacher of the gospel today that is a lie from hell. You do not believe the words of hell. But because when God reinstates you and when God reinstores you, God will give you everything that the enemy tried to take away from you. He'll restore the year that the palmer worm, the canker worm, the locust, everything you felt like you had ripped away from you, God will put it back and God will bring it into abundance. I remember one of the ministers at our church came up to me a little over a year ago. He said, Pastor, he said, I feel like we're going to pay off the building. And You ever just hear somebody say something and you're like, have you lost your mind? We'd only paid down our debt 10% in two and a half years. And he's telling me in a year we're going to pay off 90% of the debt. We don't have a God's house. I'm not that spiritual. I just have to hear from the Lord every once in a while. When I don't listen to the Lord, God sends somebody else to talk to me. So I remember he sent me an email, and, and I called. I said, Brother Raymond, I said, you, you really feel like it's the Lord? You know, like I'm questioning the man of God because we question the word of the Lord. You, I, I could feel it. When I said what I just said, there's a question to that because we said, we're Kashokton, and this is the way we do it, and we have good church, and we have good worship, and, and, and we've got a good structure, and, 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 and why are you going to try to push us today, preacher? I'm comfortable where I'm at. Can I get an Amen. 
Now, my ministry is not real comfortable. I don't live in comfort zones anymore. I pulled my muscle last week preaching. I always am in pain. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the ex-athlete in me. I don't know what it is. But I said, Lord, if I can ever get out of the comfort zone, I said, I would appreciate it. Maybe even a free weekend pass. But that's not the ministry that God's given me. Because he said, you want more, right? I said, Lord, I want more. He said, you're going to have to have a little conflict in your life. Because in order to get more, first you've got to have conflict. Because without conflict, there's no promotion. So I said, Brother Raymond, I was like, I'm going to receive that as a word from the Lord. So I called my bishop, called my pastor. I said, do you feel like that's a word from the Lord? He said, that's the Brother Stark could only do. He's like, that's a, from the Lord. If someone gets behind you, just start to believe it. I'm asking you today just to start to believe that what I'm getting ready to say, I'm, I didn't travel for two hours each way because I'm bored. I preached at Purpose Institute. My back hurt so bad when I was done because I didn't realize I stood up for three hours. And I'm an old man. But I want more from the Lord. And I said, God, use me. And he's like, I'm using you nonstop. And I'm like, okay, sorry, Lord, you are using me. But there's a little bit of conflict and there's a little bit of pain. And sometimes you want to say things and they don't come out right. And sometimes you sacrifice and you don't see immediate results. Can I get an amen? You see, Abraham and Isaac understood something. You see, sacrifice got Abraham to the mountain, but obedience kept him there. You see, when you hear a word from the Lord, you either receive it through sacrifice or you receive it through obedience. How are you hearing the man of God today? So I said, Brother Raymond, I said, we'll receive that as a word from the Lord. So I got in front of the whole church and I put it on record. Because if you're a pastor and you tell the entire church, the entire church knows exactly what you're getting ready to say. Now, I'm not going on my notes right now, but I will flow in the Holy Ghost. We'll figure this out here. Because you're wondering, does this guy know what he's talking about? Has this guy had too much coffee? What's going on? None of that is true. I don't even drink coffee. I drink juice. I drink fruits and vegetables every morning. And, and my body still hurts and because I'm getting old. And you can't slow the aging process. But that's why we serve God. Because where we fall short, God steps in. Where we can't figure out where they're at, God will show us in Coshocton where the people are so we can bring and fill God's house in. But I didn't make a lot of money and I'm on a fixed income. God can fix that as well. God did that to my wife's grandmother. She got almost a million dollars because there was a gas line running through her property. And she went from making $600 a month to a six figures from the Lord. Tell me God won't step in. So I put that number on the screen. What we owed on the church. And it was 90% of what we, we'd only paid it down 10% in two and a half years. And you know how people just look at you like you fell off a rocker. Maybe you're thinking that when I'm preaching to you. But I am so tired of listening to people that want to stay average. I'm so tired. I said, Lord, don't send me to a church this year that don't want to have revival. I don't want to waste my time. I believe this church wants revival because when I prayed that, I believe God said, I'll honor that. I said, God, if you want me to go to PI, I'll teach PI, but they better be ready is what I'm thinking because I'm not coming in with my flesh. I'm coming walking in the spirit and the fivefold ministry, whatever office that I'm going to walk in that day. I believe, God, that you can change someone's life. So I put the number up. Everybody's staring at me. I put balloons on it. It was festive. I have learned, don't just put a black screen up there. Put little balloons up there. Because they're like, ooh, I believe there's going to be a party. Either that or Pastor or Brother Raymond's lost their mind. Because there's always going to be critics. Should they be there? Should they not be there? Should they be the pastor? Should they not? Should they be praising? Maybe I should. You know what a critic does? They criticize somebody that's doing something. 
And I'm thinking this, well, if I'm going to walk for God, as I was an athlete, I will be a preacher, and I will give it everything I got. And when the Lord speaks, I will speak. And if the Lord don't speak, I won't speak. Because if you give somebody false information and they fail, that is on you. That is not on them. The word that I brought to you today is God wants to fill this place up and show you the right places to go. Everyone say, I receive it. receive seed what do you do you start carrying it around with you if you don't business cards or whatever you have of the church you're just always keeping it ready justin he's 19 years old i'm giving him a bible study and justin don't like coming to church because he likes to sleep in so do i maybe i should come to your church because it's at two but ours is at 10 30 and justin don't like to wake up and i'm like justin you're gonna have to wake up or you can't come to church so i text justin last night I said, Justin, I said, are you coming? He said, yeah, I'm going to come. I'm going to bring somebody. Is that all right? I'm like, that's not a problem at all. I said, you know, we'll have church. Justin shows up and brings another guy with him. And he's never been to an apostolic church before. And his eyes are this big and he's staring at all of us. He's like, what are these guys doing? And the last guy that came to our church last week, first time, he's like, this is the most enthusiastic church I've ever seen. I counted that as an honor. Because I got joy. And there's three churches from my house to the church that God called me to pastor. One's a Methodist, one's a Baptist, one's a Presbyterian, and they all the pastors quit, all three of them this year. Why did they quit? I got a word for you. God's fixing the moose of the these denominations around here that don't preach truth and people are going to start getting bored with all this other junk and God's going to bring them to this church and they better feel what they felt today so they know that there's a difference between the church across town and the apostolic. God is calling this church to be apostolic like never before. God is calling you, Brent, to walk in the spirit like never before. Because you got to walk in the spirit. If you don't walk in the Spirit, the five-fold ministry is going to come in. It's here today, but you got to have it every day of the week. you got to have it every service. you got to be playing. When God tells you to do something and you're under submission to your pastor, you can walk in that authority. And God will give you a new confidence. Sure, her and Aaron held up Moses' hand. That's important. But when you get up here, allow God to lift you up and elevate you and bless you and use you. Well, I wasn't very popular in high school. God's not concerned with that. I was popular in high school and it got me in trouble. It's a fact. Don't ask for my rap sheet. It's under the blood. Stuff I don't no one knows about. <laughs> so we go, we just we did it to God's house, but we did it the way we did it. We had the year thing going. It wasn't for the upkeep or anything. It was just he the word was pay it off. My bishop believed it, I believed it, Brother Raymond believed it, and when I said it to the church, we finally convinced them that it was gonna happen. Because we cut it in half after like six months. I put the number up there. I'm like, man, that's really low. I couldn't believe, like I had to recall the number. You know, I called in the phone to friend. And I'm like, I don't think it's that low. Do you sure? And the number was 40. It was the number. And I was like, man, we can really do this. And I'd make a long story very short. After 10 months, when I got up there, I had one of the, big givers in the church and the other, you know, guy that had been sacrificed in the church and the guy that gave me a word from the Lord. And when I gave the number 10 months later, it was a big fat zero as we paid off the church as God stepped in and took care of everything. But how far are you willing to go? I'm going to challenge this church because that's what I'm called to do today. I'm called to challenge you. I'm called to push you in the right direction. I'm called you to get out of your comfort zone. There's going to be some conflict come upon people, and it's not negative things in your body. It's going to be negative things come against your mind. Mm. 
there's an attack of people in their mind right now, and you think you've done something wrong. I felt it hit my body as soon as I said it. Hold on. Sometimes you're not supposed to push off everything that's heavy on you. Sometimes you're supposed to ask the Lord, what are you trying to show me? Because God said, I've tried to show you and you've not listened. He said, I put a heaviness upon you because now you will look to me. He said, I've been trying to speak to you for months, if not years, about things I've called you to do in this city. And it just as the bears tried to overtake over there in Russia, this world has tried to overtake this area in Kashokton, and there's a territory that I've called you to do, and there's people that are hurting. That same darkness that you're feeling is the darkness they're feeling. You have hope, they don't. Sing three songs, take up the offering, crack a joke, I'm with you, but let's have a move of God. Don't get in a rush. How many services you have today? You have one? Make sure you make that service the greatest service in the world. I'm not going back that day, but I'm going that back that day. We used to do it a little bit different when I was a kid. Now it's a strain. I'm going to strain a little bit. You know why? Because you remember the hell we went through when we were younger? Remember the things we didn't have? Remember all this nice stuff we didn't have? Remember these padded, remember these padded pews? Remember the wood pews? Remember the air conditioning? I mean, that they didn't have at the campground? Remember that? Remember all that conflict we used to have? Now we become comfortable and then we say, Lord, use me, Lord. Use me, God. God, use me. God, you called me. God, you called me. Yeah, but I didn't get to choose you because you won't go through condemnation. You won't go through consecration. You won't go through conflict. You won't stay covered when you don't feel covered and you want to be used. You ever seen a farmer just... When they go there, you've seen it. There's plenty of farmland around. I've come through farmland. I thought I was going to have to swim at one point to get to this church. Y'all have some water around here. But you ever seen a farmer and he walks out there and he doesn't get in a combine and he doesn't get the seeds out? All he does is start putting stalks in the ground. I'll put a stalk there. I'll put a stalk. No, he grabs a seed and he just throws it. Oh, Lord, use me. Use me, Lord, use me. And God's like, yeah. I want to use you. Where's your seed at? Well, Lord, that's for somebody else. No, it's not. You're, you're called to be a participator, not a spectator. We got too many spectators. Is he going to preach good? Does he know he's on Facebook Live? My God, I hope Brother Nutter brought somebody in with a little cord in the crib. Don't we do that sometimes? Man, how did he know him? Did the Lord really talk to him? Or couldn't he find anybody else? We try to analyze people, don't we? Do you think Hannah was so tired of being Anna by analyzed by her conspiracy theorist? Elkanah's like, okay, I've got the other one here, Paniah. She can birth them all, but Hannah, she's barren. But Kashokton. Crooksville, he can do it, but Coshocton, can he, is it barren in Coshocton? No. You think, Brother Tony Richard, because he's there, he can do better? You think, Brother, you're bishop. You think, Brother Aaron Bounds can, no, 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 he cannot. Brother Bounds is not called for Coshocton. Brother Nutter's called to Coshocton. And he'll never be Brother Bounds, but he'll be the God, the person that God called him for Coshocton. Stop comparing somebody that's not called to be here. Well, that's a word there. We love Brother Bounds, right? But we love him in Zanesville. That's where he is. We love Brother Richard in Crooksville, in New Lex, and wherever God sticks him. Last time I preached there years ago, I was like, God's getting ready to give you double. And then he got offered the church the next day in New Lex. I was like, he'll never invite me back now. Now he's got two headaches instead of one. I just send him Tylenol every month. 
But if you meet Tony Richard, a good friend of mine, family here, and you all know him, that man wants revival. That's my friend. If he called me, I wouldn't have to think they need revival. I know he wants revival. That's all he talks about, revival. I want to talk about sports to everyone, not him. He talks about revival. But I want people like that in my life. I want people that want to be better. Hannah wanted to be better, but she was barren. Elkanah was not even caring about her, and she was crucified, or he was crucifying her. Paniah was crucifying her. He was causing conflict in Hannah's life because you need someone to push you to where God wants you to go. Welcome to me today. Well, I don't think we need to give that much. I've got about $100 in my savings, and I'm going to give seven. What if the Lord tells you to give the whole 100 What if he tells you to give 200 and you don't have to have 100 in your savings? I preached for Ken Dillingham last week in Dayton, and the Lord's like, give that much money, and I want you to raise that much money. And I did it, and I was like, I left that place a lot more poor than I got there. I said, Lord, if you have me give today, I'm not going anywhere else again. Last time I was at Tony Richard's house, I gave $1,000. I gave 1000 there. I'm like, what is this? Because you never know when God's going to ask you to do something that you don't want to do. You never know when you feel so barren and you have no children and everyone's mocking you and making fun of you and disregarding what you're doing in Kishokht and saying, well, you know what? You know what's going on in the world. Yeah, God knows exactly what's going on in the world and he's not worried at all. We baptized three people today because three people got tired of going to the church across town. You know what one of the guys said? He said, I went to the Methodist church, and he said, I fell asleep. He said, I started praying. He said, in my house. He said, I started praying. He said, I started speaking in tongues as God gave me the other. He said, I never even knew what that was. You know what I've been praying? I said, God, why don't you give people visions and dreams in the middle of the night? And guess what? The last two people that have come in and have visions and dreams, and both of them been filled with the Holy Ghost, and both of them been baptized in Jesus' name. Is that what you want, Kishokton? I'm already standing up. I'm standing up. I stand up for my church every day. Will you stand in a gap for your church? I love you. I love you. I am so tired of people telling me they want revival. And I'm like, what'd you do about it? Well, you don't understand, but I'm Hannah. I don't have any children. We don't have all the resources. We don't have all the singers. We don't have all the musicians. We don't, we don't, we don't. You're so focused on what you don't have, you can't see what you do have. I preached in front of 30 people, and I preached in front of 3,000. And the same principle works. If you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. If you don't sow seed, you'll still have these same 50 or whatever's here today. But if you sow seed, God will just step in. We did something in our church, and I'm I'm so far off. People, I I called something that tied to a pagan holiday, and I wasn't even thinking about the pagan holiday. I just knew I had a word from the Lord. I said, some of y'all don't know how to trust me, man. I said, if God tells me to do something, we're going to do it. And we did it. And we did what we was called to do. And guess what happened? Nothing happened. Wow, that's real inspiring, Brother Razor. I found this about ministry, Brother Nutter. It don't matter where you sow the seed, but the seed will come back somewhere. Next week, Jovi came. Next week, Christine came. Next week, Jeff came. Next person, next person came. Someone came to youth service. What? I didn't know they were coming. Yeah, you didn't know, but God knew it because you sowed seed at that big event. And God said, I was just checking your motive. Is your motive right? The problem is not God wanting to give you what Hannah had. Can you, can you give God the glory when he blesses you? <laughs> this making any sense? Hannah was facing undeserved pain, but when God's favor is upon you, Hannah means the favor of God. You mean I got the favor of God and I don't see it? Yeah. I grew up so poor. If you know my family, 
my mom stayed at home, and my dad, you ready for this, made a whopping $7 an hour. He worked for AVI. He filled vending machines up. He, he repaired them. We grew up so poor. We had one Chevette, and mom and dad was in the front, and me, Shane, my two ugly-looking brothers, Shane and Scott, were in the back seat, and I'm right in the middle because I'm the middle child, and we're in the back of a Chevette because we didn't have any money. And we had to get 90 miles a gallon or whatever those stupid things go because we couldn't afford gas. So I grew up poor. My parents filed for bankruptcy, and I have the saddest story that you would ever hear. I could sing a country music song if I wanted to, but I said that generational curse is going to be broken in my home, and we're not going to struggle with finances. My mom and dad fought almost every day about money. Let's go to Cedar Point, Tim. We can't go to Cedar Point. Why? Because we don't have the money. Because you've got a drug problem. You care more about cocaine than you do Christ. Well, well, I have a bad childhood and I've got a bad home life. Get over it. I did. I told my wife, I was like, we will not file bankruptcy. We will not barely get by. We will not live paycheck to paycheck. I don't care if I barely make any money, but something's going to be done because I'm going to learn to be a giver. So right in the middle of this pandemic, God's like, give all this money to the building fund. I'm like, I don't even know if the church is, we gonna, our finances is going to be okay. I do real estate. Can I sell real estate? You know, I'm telling God everything that he, that I'm trying to help the Lord help me. I know I'm digging with y'all, but y'all got to believe me here in a minute. So, I give this dollar amount that I don't want to give, and then I go to these churches, and I give all this money away. and I just keep giving money, and I keep giving money, and I keep throwing sacrifice on the altar. You know the brazen altar? You know the biggest place in the tabernacle of Moses? You know where sacrifice is consumed? At the brazen altar. The first place when you walk into the church. You see, what happens is we get a poverty man mindset, and we say, well, I'm on Social Security, or my dad was poor, or this is going on, and this is God's house, and things can't change here. It's not true. So right in the middle of this pandemic, I'm like, I, God tells me to give all this money. So I give all this money, and people in the church are given, and we pay off all the debt, and the church is debt-free, and I'm just thanking the Lord for it. But, and I want to tell you this part of the testimony. In the middle of that, I paid off my wife's car. I paid off my car, I paid off our house, I paid off my student loan, I paid off a line of credit I have, and now attached to me right now, in my mid-40s, I know I don't look it, but in my mid-40s, everything attached to me is debt-free. This is his house. If you take care of his house, he'll take care of your house. Here's what's going to go on. At the end of the altar call, God's going to heal some people to confirm his word. You believe it? Yes. Whether you believe it or not, it's going to happen. I found out years ago, God's not, God is not, he doesn't get excited whether I believe something or not because he's God. Well, God can't bolt backsliders up. He can't. God can't restore people. He can't. You know who's preaching to you today? A guy that almost died at 19 years old. 200 over 120 blood pressure. My mom turns pale white, and she said, you're going to, she said, she, I, was like, I was like, what's wrong? She's like, we got to take, we, we got to do something. I said, mom, take me to the hospital. Just let me die. I said, I'm done. I'm fighting with this. I mean, I had everyone around me, but I was so alone. But what was I willing to give up to give what God wanted? God cared more about my ministry and my salvation than he did my health that day. I said, Mom, take me to the hospital. Take me to rehab. Take me wherever you go. I had so many drugs and alcohol inside of me. I should not be alone. But you want to talk about the worst day of your life? I've had that time, Tim, and I caused it on my own. But my mom was a consecrator. My mom was a giver. <laughs> my, God, my mom believed that God could do anything. And I remember she put her hands, I was on the bed, I was shaking, I couldn't even control my body, I fell to the ground, couldn't even walk. She put her hands on my head, 
And she spoke the word of faith over me like we're going to do here in a minute. And as you pray the authority of the word of God, and by the power of the name of Jesus, I take dominion and authority over any sickness, disease, and infirmity in your body, and I command it to dry up in the name of Jesus. And we're going to do that here in a minute. And hell's got to realize something every time I get behind the pulpit. I'm still standing. What hell tried to take out, hell didn't know that Benaiah was pushing me out of my barrenness. My barrenness. I'm going to play the keyboard again. I'm going to sing again. I'm going to play the guitar again. I'm going to sing again. I'm going to go to church on Sunday. I'm going to go on Wednesday. I'm going to keep going through the motion. One of these days, I'm going to be the pastor of the church. I'm going to show them. I'm just going to go through the motion. I'm going to get up and sing. I'm going to do what's right. You know what? I'm going to help out. I'm going to submit. I'm going to do everything I can, but you're just going to barely get by. barely get by you get stuck and you can't birth what Hannah wanted to give Hannah wouldn't just have Sandy Hannah would have more God don't want to just give this church a Sandy but he wants to give you more but you have to be convinced when everyone look at me I want you to become convinced kids I want you to be convinced Coming here with oxygen, you can leave without oxygen. I was in Columbus at Bo Thompson's church. Guy coming up, big old, I think it was like, you know, the green oxygen tank. Kid went up there, he prayed for her, he left, carried it out, lifted off, died again. A dead man. When I died spiritually, I gained everything. What are you going to give up today? sing you're a need but what's going to happen today God's going to challenge you guys to give something that you weren't going to give that God's going to give you a higher number and when God gives you that higher number the altar in your ministry and your life goes up and the confidence that you've been asking for and the things you've been asking for God's going to give it to you because he sees you want to grow your altar Not everybody's going to get what you get today, but I think you see where God's going to take you. And if you understand what God wants to do in your life, you'll never go back to the way you used to be again. You receive that? You know, the gift of prophecy is in there. When you get up there, you know, John 15, 16, you didn't put yourself there, God put you there. You worry where Anthony is. God got you right where you need to be, man. And you're powerful for God. But God's going to challenge you to step into five-fold ministry. And you're young and you don't think you're qualified. You ask Brother Bounds. It does not determine your age. It determines your hunger level. When you get up, next time you get up, you're not going to be the same. You receive that? When you get up here, there's going to fire come over you. And you're not going to know where it come from, but it's going to come from the Lord. If you'll receive it. And God's going to use you to push him to places he don't want to go. And you need to listen to her. Because if you can't listen to anyone in ministry, you've got to be able to listen to your wife. Because your wife loves you more than anybody. Well, it's not the way I thought that was. It's all stand. Sometimes when we come and put money in the offering plate, we come what we have in our pocket or we come with something we've always done, don't we? Anybody else just grab it? I never have cash. I don't know why I have cash today. Anybody ever weep through these? There's the dollar for the church. You know what? I felt a move of the Lord. There's five. Oh, God, that's a $20 bill. Anybody ever struggle giving a 20? Just be honest with me. I mean, you don't have to raise your hand. You struggle giving a 20 sometimes. You know what this money is? 
You say, yeah, I know what it is, preacher. What do you think I am? No, this money is your ministry. What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to give up? You're going to give what you have out of abundance, or you're going to give what the Lord tells you to do? You know how we beat this whole thing? You know how I don't have any debt at all? And I, I burnt my de- We burnt our mortgage deed in my backyard this summer. We had a mortgage burning ceremony. We're getting to have one next month for our church. And Brother Stark's going to be there. He's like, I don't know how you paid off that church so soon, but we need to figure that out. But you know what? That's all we do. We do a sacrifice. The Lord tells us to give, we give. I don't care where you're at, you're just giving. You give $5, you give 20 If I did this to my kids, they'd already be up here right now. But I think the church doesn't understand the money unlocks the door to what God wants to do in your life. When I go out to eat now, I don't worry about it because, like, I don't have a mortgage payment. I don't have a car payment. I have no debt. I don't have to worry about paying a mortgage payment at the church because I don't have a mortgage payment at the church. And I take zero credit for it. But I'm trying to teach you a principle today. What are you willing to give up? How big's your brazen altar going to be? Are you going to give what you gave last time because that's what we always do? Well, preacher, I'm just going to give five because that's what I gave. I gave 100. We got 200 here. Or did you pray about it? And God challenged you. I know we're challenged by Jack, Brother Lehman, to give to missions. But let's be challenged today what God wants to say. God wants to unlock some things. The more money this church gives is the more freedom and liberty the Spirit will have in here. We're a young church that I pastor. But I'm telling you, we nonstop have a move of God. It's always free. The singers sing. The preacher preaches. And I don't have to convince people that God will do it because we're givers. And God wants to challenge this church. I want to unlock this church so large. I want to expand it so much. But are you willing to give what I want you to give? There's so much on you right now. Worry about your age or what you've been through. David Smith started evangelizing when he was 38. And when God unlocks the door and he turns up the faucet, David Smith told me he preached 350 tomorrow night. It's not about if you're called, that's what you do, right? If you're not called to evangelize, you don't do that. But if you're called to sing, you sing. But you have to have that anointing so thick on you that when you walk up there, that you'll feel the Spirit of God so thick when you open your mouth and this microphone gets going that you know the power of the Spirit is right on you. And you never question yourself. But you got to give up everything. That's everything I have. That's all I brought in. I have no more money. Well, preacher, I would like to have whatever this is, $30, $40. I would like to have everything you're talking about. Will that work for me? Yeah. It's a principle, the word of God. If you sow it, you'll reap it. And I got to thinking, I was like, how, how do we pay off the church? And, and, and how did I pay off all, all my home? And how did I pay? You know, I went and bought a car. I just bought a car, right? I have a nice car. I have a Toyota Sequoia. It's gorgeous. People are like, man, that is an expensive car. I was like, yeah, it is. And I paid cash for it. Boy, aren't you big and bad. You know what? You know how many times I've gave to the church? You know how many times my wife gave her Louis Vuitton purse? I gave my hot tub. I gave my Mickey Mantle card. I give everything that I had. And I said, Lord, I just want you to have it all. You know how many times I went to the brazen altar and I took the sacrifice? You know how many times I did that? You know how many times I didn't want to give? You know how many times God told me to give something I didn't want to give? Because our money dictates our ministry. So I went to the Sequoia dealership or Toyota dealership, and I was like, I want, a, I want that car there. And he said, well, we'll get the financing ready. I said, I don't want that. I said, I have a cashier's check for $35,000 right here. And I said, I would like to pay cash for that. And I test drove it. The tires were all jacked up. The car was in great shape, but the tires were old. I said, I want new tires on it. And I said, I'll give you this check. He's like, you have it on you? I said, it's right here, brother. Pulled it out. You know, you can get a little arrogant.
getting the Holy Ghost when you got $35,000 check in your back pocket? If you know me, I grew up in not even Zanesville, South Zanesville. My parents couldn't afford to live in Zanesville. Like, we'd go to Zanesville, like, let's go, let's go to the aristocrats up off Maple Avenue. It's the truth. Southtown, Maysville. We play Kashocked in the Redskins and we beat them. But when you, and, and my cashier's check was just this size. I mean, it was, you know, these cashier's checks are about just like this. And I walked in there and I laid it on his desk and he's like, he looked at it like, you know, like, is this fraud? You know what I mean? Like, where'd you get that at, buddy? Cashier's check for 35. He said, let me go talk to my boss. He came back and he said, guess what? He said, we'll give you thousand dollars get new tires so I called the discount tire right right there I was in Evansville Indiana I wasn't even in Ohio I was looking for a car in Indiana because you can't find a car anywhere so you got to travel over God's creation and I'm carrying around this thirty five thousand dollar money order cashier's check and his boss like we'll give you a thousand so I called discount tire and I said how much would the four nicest tires I get on that he said nine hundred and ninety eight dollars dollar check for me. Came $35,000 check to him. He took it up. Five minutes later, I had my wife signed all the paperwork. Everything's in her name because God knows I'm going before she is. So everything's in her name. And I have my car. And I don't have a car payment. But guess how many times I went to the brazen altar? Guess how many times I ripped up what I wanted to do and I gave it to God. But right now, and then my wife's like, I need a car. I have 190000 on mine. Not one problem on her car with 190000 miles. Guy comes in, gives us $10,000 for a car that we had for five years. I took that $10,000 and the money we'd saved up, and she said, you know what? I called this guy off Craig, or this lady off Craigslist. Scary, right? And I was like, how did you not sell that car for that price? She said, well, uh, I don't really know how to work Craigslist. And, and I said, okay. I said, how many people have contacted? She said, well, you're the only one. So we test drove it. There was nothing wrong with it. It was five thousand in this market, the low asking price. So I gave her twenty-four thousand dollars. I I spent fifty-nine thousand dollars in cash, and I don't make that much money because of this. If I could just convince you what I'm saying really works for everybody, I have no pedigree. My parents filed for divorce. My parents. I had a rough childhood, man. I almost killed myself multiple times. I would get the knife out and go like that because I had everything that everyone thought I had, but I had nothing. Anybody convinced a little bit more than they should have been? Not so much. Jesus. Everybody should be convinced, and especially you should for something. I seen it when you were singing on stage. I seen there was something inside of you that was just churning in your spirit. And it was a fight inside of you. It was almost like a muscle. And the muscle was just had a knot in it. And God was trying to pull that knot out. And there was conflict inside of your spirit. And God said, there's such an anointing. And there's such a purity in there. But there's something that happened when she was younger that cl closes up every time I try to release it. And every time you speak, there's something that just, it just opens and then it closes itself. There's nothing wrong with either of them. They're just going higher today. It's all right. shall become one. If you need something from me, physically, emotionally, or financially, here's what I want us to do. I know this sounds kind of strange, but the people that need financial, they want you to come around and make money and you can't do that. If you need a financial change, God's going to heal some people, and God's going to change some people. If you need a financial thing right here, if you need a physical right here, if you need emotional right here, step out on faith. And don't worry, that person can't help you anyway. Just look at them.
Lord will create financial growth. what I'm saying to you. submitted, everything's working out real well. But sometimes we become blank for what God's done in the past and what he's doing in the future. Don't we? I have preached this message three other places because the Lord told me to do it. And I've seen the difference between those that are convinced and those that are not. Is everyone healed in the back? Everybody good back there? As long as you're okay, that's fine. Do you want to be healed? sometimes, but you know what? We are so worried what people think about us. But I respect you, and I honor you, and God will honor what you're doing and saying. You don't think it's just, you don't think I've went through that before as a pastor? You don't think that I've wanted to be in that line? You don't think I've ever been? I've been in that line before. There's people that need to be up here, but you're going to carry it back home with you. Because you're more worried about your image than you are your healing. Amen. I love you. I do. I love you. Are you up for what you're supposed to do? Can you stand right beside me? Anybody for financial support? Everybody loaded? Yes. Hey, babe, can you take off your clothes? I know this is a giving thing. This is what this is. When you give it, it unlocks something. This church has probably never been better than it is right now. But that's why I'm here. Because one day when the, something's passed the baton, it's going to be a lot better. But you've got to be convinced what I'm doing now, or you'll never get where God wants you to go. And I'm talking about people. God wants to put people in this church. God don't want you always playing the same instrument that you always need. God wants other people to help you guys out. We have seven cleaning teams at our church. It's my favorite ministry in the whole church. It's called, it's called Mop the Mic Program. I started it. And if you don't clean the toilet, I don't want to hear what you have to say up there. It's what we do. I don't care. I'm old-fashioned. I don't care. But I'm telling you right now, we're an apostolic church. And we don't have any debt. Stop listening to people who don't have any corn in the crib and start listening to people that actually get it done. Don't go to financial advice and, oh, I'm giving to that church and you've given up that church and they can't even pay their own bills. I'm not coming here just saying stuff. I'm coming here because God did it for me and he wants to do it for people in this church.
still want to come up, you're still allowed to come up. Uh, last call, if you're in the world, you know what last call means, don't you? It means you want another drink. There's plenty, there's plenty up here. Don't you ask, ask all spiritual. I mean, you guys know what last call is. We all drank and did a little drunk. Oh. There's still time. Come on up. church that we get $5,000. When I was going to Dillingham's church, God's like, start with $5,000. i am like, Lord, I'm Sunday night here. We're not doing God's house. We're just preaching. He's like, I want you to raise money for their church. This guy comes up to me and he's like, man, I, I feel like I should give $10,000. He said, do you think it's from the Lord? I said, do you want to give $10,000? He said, no. I said, do you think the devil wants to give you $10,000? He said, of course not. I said, well, I think you answered the question. The money you give to this house will go a lot further than any other place you can put it. I gave $25,000 in three weeks to Benny DeMerchant, Brother DeMerchant, to David Smith and to another person. Eli Hernandez. Eli's brother Hernandez went and gone, but that seed that I sowed under that prophet is still alive today. And I really believe that's why I have the freedom I have to, to do whatever I do. Because I have no pedigree. My dad's dead and my mom's retired. I have no pedigree. You guys ready to be healed? been up here a lot to pray for and so have you so have you you're probably up here people probably pray for you a lot too I can't pray for you right now I won't pray for you right now does anybody believe it tonight I'm so convinced it's going to happen I don't know how many it's going to happen to but I know it's going to happen to some so don't allow my wife or me to pray harder than pray as hard as I keep going, okay? It's not me that needs healed from the physical thing or the emotional thing, but I've been on that line, and I've been on that line, but I will have compassion when I pray for you. But I have faith in you. I've seen it happen all over the country. It's going to happen at the shopping center. You ready? All right, everyone that wants to be prayed for, I want you to raise both your hands if you're able. If you're not able, don't raise your hand. We've seen Brother Smith do it and all these other people. We're doing the same exact thing. And we're going to keep praying. As soon as I speak the word of faith, they're going to play. And I don't want you to get in a hurry. But I want you to keep praying until God touches you or you're completely healed. Now, if God completely heals you, I want you to give him the glory. I don't want you to give me the glory. I don't want you to give my wife the glory. But I want you to give God the glory. By the authority of the word of God and by the power that's in the name of Jesus, I take authority and dominion over the spirit of infirmity, the spirit of affliction. I pray for mental anguish to be lifted. Lord, I speak this as a prophet right now in the name of Jesus. Church, lift your voice.
receive it in the name of Jesus.